Good morning, beautiful people. I am so excited to see you all here and to welcome you to worship at Marshall United Methodist Church. This is a place where all people are welcome and where all people are loved and where all people are forgiven. My name is Pastor Erin Fitzgerald, and it is my privilege to serve among you and worship with you today. I want to make sure that this space is welcoming and inclusive for everybody. And do you know what has been happening the last couple of weeks? We have had some guests come in late. We're not going to judge them for that, right? But they have been having a hard time finding a seat. So if you're someone who's really comfortable in this space, there's an open table here, there's an open table here, there's an open table here, and there's two over here. If you're comfortable moving, make some space for the new friends at the back to find their way. That would be wonderful. Also, we have these connection cards. If you are new here, in the black folders on your tables, there are connection cards. This is our way to plug you into what God is doing in and through the life of the church. You can let us know your contact information, your prayer request, and also what you're interested in doing next, how we can help serve you. Those are great ways for you to engage and take your first step here. Those are also available on our website for those of you who are watching online. We want to greet you and welcome you in the name of Jesus and also make sure that you feel connected. Make sure you leave us a comment and say hello or share your prayer request. This week, we have a couple of things that are kicking off. The first is our movie series for the month of February, which has an anti-racism focus. The first movie we're going to watch together is 42, which features Harrison Ford and Chadwick Bosman, and it's about Jackie Robinson and his experience playing baseball for the, uh, yeah, Brooklyn Dodgers. Great. It was in my head. Sports ball. Yeah. Um, you can watch the movie at home or in a group setting here at church on Tuesday afternoons. And there's two discussion groups that you can plug into on Thursdays. One is during the day at 1 o'clock and the other is at 7 p.m. in the evening. You can see myself or Maddie for more information. On Wednesday, we have our community meal, which is open to all and is free. We have dine-in service, and we also have takeout service. So if you've got a busy week and you just need to pull around back and pick up a meal for you and your family, make things easier, we welcome that and encourage you to call the church office to make your reservation. The menu this week is pulled pork sandwiches and coleslaw and french fries. Doesn't that sound delicious? If that sounds delicious to you, make sure that you get yourself there and uh, a free will offering will be accepted as well to help us cover the cost. On Friday this week, February the 10th at 7 p.m., we have our Euchre Night and you're welcome to come. Uh, we can teach you how to play cards. We can also um, just make fellowship if you're not interested in anything but the checks mix. So come and enjoy. That's at 7 o'clock. You can bring a snack or a drink to pass if you'd like. These are all the announcements I have for you. Now will you stand and join us in our first song of praise, Only King Forever.
never stopped moving. Not once has he ever let go. Not once did he ever stop proving. Our God is in control. Not once did he ever stop moving. Not once has he ever let go. Not once did he ever stop proving. Our God is in control. When did he break his promise? When did his kindness fail? Never has, never will. My God is still the same. When did he lose his power? When did his mercy change? Never has, never will. My God is still the same. Yeah. Not once did he ever stop moving. Not once has he ever let go. Not once did he ever stop proving our God is in control. Not once did he ever stop moving. Not once has he ever let go. Never has, never will. My God is still the same. My God is still the same. My God is still the same. You guys sound good this morning. I second that. Rob seconds that. I second that. And you took me by the hand And you marched me out in freedom Into the promised land And now I will not forget you now I'll sing of all you've done Death is swallowed up forever By the fury of your
Good morning. Can I have all of my kid friends come forward this morning? I would love to spend some time with you. Hi. How are you, ladies? Hi. Good morning. I have a question for you this morning. Are there any rules at your house? A lot of rules. Wow. So tell me one. What's one rule at your house? No jumping on the couch. Good, good. What's one rule at your house? No jumping on the couch. Wow. Same rule, same two different houses. Interesting. Um, is there any rule at school that you have to follow? Like at recess, what would be a rule at recess? Don't go into the bushes at recess. Got it. Good, good. What's a, what's a rule for you at school? Don't climb up the slides. Slides are for sliding down, not for climbing up. Yeah, that's a good rule. Good rule. So I have a friend. His name is John, John Wesley, and he gave us three rules for what it means to follow Jesus. He said, do no harm do good, and stay in love with God. Today we're going to talk about do no harm. What would it mean to do no harm? Hmm. Don't hurt anybody. Yeah, right. So should I, should I pinch you? No. Should I kick you? No. Should I take your necklace? No. Should I tie your shoes together? No, no, we're not going to do any harm. We're going to be kind. We're going to be loving. We're going to stand up for what's right. And we're going to use our words and our bodies to respect people, right? Yeah. So I need you to use your bodies and your words today to help me do a couple of things. Will you help me? First of all, we have these cool prayer shawls. Come on over here. Take a look at them. They're all different colors. Aren't they cool? Feel how soft they are. Some of them sparkle. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up a couple of you. Emmy, can I wrap you up? Great. Is that nice and cozy? We're going we're gonna to tuck you in like a little burrito. There we go. Perfect. Quinn, can I wrap you up too? Yeah. Oh, very nice. Very nice. And we're going to help the congregation bless the prayer shawls today. Okay? So you guys are going to walk around and say, God is good. And they're going to say, all the time. So let's practice. And say, God is good. That's right. They're going to motor around and help you bless the prayer shawls. And then Aiden and Evan, my other helpers today, are going to help me collect the noisy offering. You remember how to do this? Okay, so that's right. I'm going to trade you. Okay. Um, so the, the noisy offering today, my friends, is for Mobile Meals, Inc. of Marshall. Mobile Meals, Inc. of Marshall is a ministry that we partner with Oakland Hospital. They make food in the hospital kitchens for people who are sick. And then volunteers drive the food to their houses. They go ding dong and they deliver the meals when people are sick or recovering from surgery or after having babies, things like that. Okay? All right. So I'm going to send you out. Go use your bodies and your words to do good. Go do no harm. Say, God is good.
All right, my friends, if they still have their hands in the air, they still have something for you. They still want to bless Mobile Meals, Inc. of Marshall. Here they come. Here they come. All right, when you've got it all, come on back up, and we'll say a special prayer. Anybody else left? He went, oh, Quinn and Emmy, can you come, can you come see Mr. Davis? Right here. There you go. Your name is not Quinn. Okay, thank you. Very good. All right, come up here, ladies. Good job, good job. All right, we're going to make some noise. Dump it in there. Good. Very good. Can you hold that? Very good. Very good. Can you hold that? All right, let's say a prayer together. Ready? Dear God, thank you for helping us feed people. Help them heal and be strong. Amen. Thank you so much for coming down today. We have kids worship if you would like to go with Miss Tracy and Miss Karen. And nursery is open if you would like to go to Miss Shannon. Or you could choose to stay in worship. It's your choice. Thank you, friends. Well, good morning again. I do have a friend named John, John Wesley. He's older than me by a few hundred years, but we share a birthday. John Wesley and I were both born on June 28th. It's a fun fact about your pastor. <clears throat> she and the founder of United Methodism were born on the same day. That makes me really special. Today, my friends, we are starting a new sermon series for the month of February. It's just a little three-week series that's going to get us from today to the beginning of the holy season of Lent. But there is a whole lot of depth and richness within this series called Three Simple Rules. And so I want to give you some historical context today. I want to give you some biblical context today and talk about how we can apply these three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God right here and right now. There's a couple scripture passages that make a whole lot of sense to pair with the first rule, do no harm. And the first comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 15. He's talking about gossiping, he's talking about slandering, he's talking about respecting folks with your words and disrespecting folks in speech and patterns. And so he says this, if, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. We think about that and how we use our words and how insults have affected us and what it takes when we are reeling from the pain that our words have caused. There's another passage from Paul's book uh, to the Romans, and not to the Romans, but Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the love who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. 
and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is fulfilling of the law. So these three simple rules, do no harm, do good, stay in love with God, are John Wesley's principles or ground rules for Christian living. They are rooted in the grace and love of God because the whole Methodist tradition is founded upon this principle of grace. We didn't earn it, we don't deserve it, and yet it's free, no strings attached, and offered to everyone, everywhere. We believe all people receive God's grace and that that's God's gift to us. That no one can control that. No one can manipulate it. No one can decide who gets it and who doesn't. But yet, it is free to all of us. So the rules are rooted in this gift of grace and love and the idea that everything that is good, everything that is lovely, everything that is loving is of God. So we should root ourselves in those things as well. Now, like many rules, they exist because there is the reality of the broken world. There is the reality that harm has been caused, right? I asked the children what were some of the rules in their home and in their school, and they both said, no jumping on the couch. Well, that rule was invented because they jumped on the couch, right? <laughs> right? The, the no climbing up the slide was invented because somebody climbed up the slide while somebody else was coming down on their behind and there was a collision and they toppled over the side, right? Disaster. Rules were invented because they're necessary. Same thing existed for John Wesley. He saw that there were societal ills. He saw that folks were doing harm. He saw that folks were not living in the footsteps of Jesus. And so he invented these rules for us to live by. The rules exist because problems exist. And evil and pain are as real as the way we experience them. The way we experience pain and suffering when we're harmed emotionally or physically or psychologically, sexually or spiritually. We're humans, right? And as humans, we seek power and control, which means that we're going to create hierarchies and systems that impoverish and oppress and seek to control others who are different from us. And yet we're also Christian and followers of Jesus. So we live in the middle of this Venn diagram where we want to do good. We want to do no harm. We want to love God. And so we look to Jesus who teaches us to care and love one another, to act as peacemakers. He teaches us that humility and self-control are fruits of the Spirit. And so we're going to get a little fruity we're going to see what it looks like to live by these rules. In John Wesley's context, when he was ministering in England, slavery was legal, and also the Church of England was practicing exclusion based on segregation, based on socioeconomic status, based on whether you were educated or not. And he saw that God's grace made everyone equal. God loves everyone the same. And so he sought to turn that around. He sought to include others. He taught that salvation was abhorrent, was wrong, was sinful, was something that Christians should not practice. And when he was in church, he was looking at people who were slave owners. He was looking at people who were different from the people that they were engaging with in the public sector. And so he wanted to change that up. So he wrote this rule. He preached on this rule. The rule itself, in Wesley's words, said that to continue on the way of salvation means living in harmony with God. 
that we should begin by doing no harm, by avoiding evil of every kind, especially that which is most generally practiced. So in his society, the evil that was most generally practiced was slavery, was keeping this hierarchy of whether you were educated, whether you made a lot of money, whether you were in or out based on your skin color. John Wesley was also a physician in England, and so he understood do no harm in terms of the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take. He worked really hard to do no harm in his ministry and in his medical practice. As Methodism moved across the Atlantic to the United States, slavery was still happening, and so he started teaching here in America what that looks like. Fast forward, and we still had that problem in the early 20th century. And so the church was building itself up on these principles that were really countercultural, that were really asking us to live our faith, to preach, practice what we preach, walk the walk, and talk the talk. So that was the history of it all, and now we have to ask the question of what do these rules mean for us today? What do these rules mean for us today, and how can we work on them in our daily life? One of our United Methodist bishops, Reuben Job, who is a pastor that came out of Indiana, he wrote this little tiny book that's only 88 pages long, and you pretty much have to wear your bifocals to read it. But... It is a wonderful explanation of the three simple rules, and I reread it in preparation for this sermon series. I have to tell you, of all the textbooks I received in seminary, I think was, this one was the most difficult because it really made the rubber hit the road. It really made me examine who I am, who I'm called to be, how I'm called to live and love and serve, and what it means to do that as a reflection of the Jesus that is my king, my savior, the light of my life. So the way this connects for me is a couple of really real ways. We know that harm can happen to both people and to both society. And um, earlier this week on Friday, I was invited by Daniel Jones, who's the executive director of The Haven. He was here a couple weeks ago to invite us to Ice Jam and the Blues Fest and um, the Chili Cook-Off. And we raised some money. We raised about $1,400 for The Haven that day. Well done. And um, they were getting ready to, to launch their big fundraiser of the year. And Daniel invited me to come and speak at the graduation ceremony for the Women's Life Recovery Program. Up until that time, I knew that the Haven was a homeless shelter and, and worked with folks who were on their journey towards sobriety, but I didn't know what the Women's Life Recovery Program was, so I studied up on it and learned that it's this amazing 12-step program that takes 12 full months to complete and that men and women journey in the program separately and they work on getting clean, they work on getting the pieces of their life put back together, they work on reunifying with their families, and they work on finding their next steps so that they can be productive citizens who contribute in our city and in our state in positive ways. So on Friday, I went to Family Altar Bible Church, who I don't think had ever seen a female in the pulpit, but that's okay. And um, we, uh, we had a graduation ceremony. There were five women, five women, who had completed this program um, from February 2022 to, to uh, Friday, and they all stood up proud as could be, extremely emotional, and they declared to the congregation and their family and friends, the state senator and the mayor who was there, that they were clean and sober for one year year. That's right. Each participant made a choice to do no harm to themselves. They made a choice to give up 
their addiction to alcohol, to drugs, to gambling, to prostitution, to all these things that were holding them back from living the life that God envisioned for them, from being healthy and from being whole, from being parents, from being professionals, from being followers of Jesus. There was one woman who stood up in the middle of her testimony and she said that when she began the program at the Women's Life Recovery Center, she prayed to a God she did not know. But because there were so many others who were working in her best interest, who were praying for her, who were sitting through therapy sessions with her, who were on call when she needed her sponsor, who were there for her through thick and thin. She had the confidence of other people's faith that would see her through the program. It was a powerful testimony about the evil of addiction, the pain that it caused their loved ones, the decades of violence and trauma that they had to work through, and the problems that it created all along their career, in their health, in their finances. But on that day, just a couple days ago, On that Friday, they made a pledge, they made a promise to God, to neighbor, and to each other as a community of women who had been through the program together to do no harm. It was a powerful, powerful ceremony to be a small part of. The other place where this connects is in a movie that I watched recently. It's a movie that is a part of our anti-racism series coming up in February. And it's the movie 42, the movie about Jackie Robinson. There is a man in the movie played by Harrison Ford. His name is Wesley Branch Rickey, named after John Wesley. I didn't know that. But he is he's the coach of the Brooklyn Dodgers team. And he's the man who recruited Jackie Robinson, the first African-American male to play on an integrated team. Jackie joined the team in April of 1947 when segregation was still practiced all throughout minor league baseball and major league baseball and in schools and all the things. But Branch Rickey decided that the time had come for American baseball to set a new standard, to do no harm. He did another thing, which I think speaks volumes, and that is that uh, when Jackie Robinson joined the team and went up to bat, he noticed that the pitchers were throwing the ball, not across home plate, but directly at Jackie's head, seeking to inflict harm. And so Branch Rickey instituted a new rule that all Brooklyn Dodgers would wear a helmet, a batting helmet, every time they went up to bat, every time a pitch was thrown. He was committed to do no harm, not just for Jackie, but for every player on his team to keep them safe and to keep the sport played clean. These examples of both how harm is done in an individual way and in a corporate way speak volumes for us. But I wonder if there's another question that begs asking today, and Bishop Job asks this in his little book. He asks the readers to consider, what is one thing that you would never, ever do that you think, nope, that's impossible. I would never go there. I would never touch that. I would never say that. Think in your minds for a second about what is that one thing that you would never consider doing that is just antithetical to who you are. You have it? Give me a thumbs up if you have it. Yeah, maybe it's something that you would never speak ill behind someone's back. You would never speed in your car. You would never eat ketchup. That's one of mine. You would, um, you would never swear or yell or lay a hand on a child. Something, something that you would never, ever do. One of mine 
is that I would never, ever refuse someone the sacrament of Holy Communion. That is God's gift of grace. That is a means by which we know that the love of Jesus Christ is real and that it's powerful and it's transformative and that it's for everybody. If Jesus offered communion to Judas, the disciple who would betray him, then Jesus can offer it to me and you and everybody in between. So maybe you're not the person who says, well, I'd never get addicted to alcohol or drugs, or I'd never own a slave. But there is something else in your life that you want to say. I'd never do that. I'd never do that kind of harm. Well, the next challenge that Bishop Job offers us is, okay, well, think about the things that really set you on fire, the things that really get you hot and bothered, the stuff that is just enough of a trigger that if somebody brings it up, if you see it, you can't stand it, and you have to do something. Y'all have things like that in your life? Triggers that are hot button issues, whether it's abortion or or gun violence or LGBT issues, the mega site, you name it, Marshall's got a few things, right? We all have a few things. Well, Bishop Job argues that in John Wesley's context, these were the things that he was speaking to. These were the things that he was saying, do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Bishop Job says that in America, we've been given the right to have freedom of speech. And if John Wesley knew about that, he would understand how very hard it would be for Jesus' followers to do no harm. The Bible has tons of things to say about how we guard our lips and our words against gossip, against slander, against judgments, against saying things that insult others or demean or belittle others. And yet it happens. We've all said things that we didn't mean. We've all said things that were hurtful. We have all had a knee-jerk reaction to something on social media and let them have it. But the challenge of this rule is that we make a commitment, a covenant, a promise to guard our lips, our mind, our heart, so that our language will not disparage or injure or wound another child of God. We have to take a moment to think about how each person is beautiful, is beloved in the eyes of God, and is therefore not worthy of harm not worthy of extra pain, not worthy of the suffering that words can cause. Bishop Job once again says that when we agree that we will not harm someone with our words, even if we disagree, that opens up an opportunity for conversation, for dialogue, for discovery of new insights and new perspectives. A whole new horizon, a whole new world opens up when we realize that we are not pitted against each other, me versus you, them versus us, Republican versus Democrat, farmers versus workers. It's not about the harm. It's about the conversation, the dialogue, the way in which when we love one another, when we see one another as children of God, we do no wrong to our neighbors. So the challenge then becomes, before we speak, we ask ourselves this question. Is what I'm about to say true Is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it helpful? 
If you can deconstruct your thoughts and and patterns and your knee-jerk reactions into those categories, is it true, is it kind, is it necessary, is it helpful, you will be faithful to this rule. You will be faithful to the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us to love one another. So, in the midst of this series, in the midst of seeking to understand this great commandment and these three simple rules, we're being invited into a time where we can examine the way we live and practice our faith. Are we walking the walk? Are we talking the talk? Do our actions and our speech reflect God's grace and love? We're also asking that we Try to see each person as a child of God. That we are going to look through our bifocals, through our binoculars, through the lens of everyday life, and seek the face of Christ in all people. When you value someone else's humanity as much as your own, you'll be able to respect them, even if you disagree. We're also being invited to be on guard, to watch for the people and the places and the topics that trigger our reactions. How can you do no harm? How can you practice the fruits of the spirit, humility and self-control when something sets you off and makes you so on fire? And also, how can you speak truth to power How can you stand up for what is right when others are being silent? Something else happened on Friday this week, my friends, and um, there was some chaos and confusion and commotion in our community. There was a violent threat at Marshall High School on Friday morning, so much so that the school was locked down and Walters Elementary School was locked down. Children were still eating breakfast, getting to their classrooms, putting things away in their locker. They were in first period. Some were even still on buses while all this happened. And so the state police, Marshall police, the school district, everybody worked together to make sure that our kids were safe that the threat could be either eliminated or resolved in a safe manner. Marshall United Methodist was a part of doing no harm on Friday morning because we were the secure location where students who were still on buses were sent. We were the evacuation site so that kids could be safe when they were still in transit while this threat was resolved. Rob Monahan was in the building, and he was giving a music lesson when the police pulled in, and then the school buses pulled in, and then the crisis team pulled in behind. It was quite a morning. We got a call to say, is your building open? Are you able to help? We said, yes. We said, yes, what can we do? Come in. Our doors are open. We're not quite ready, but we'll do the best we can. Everybody worked hard to ensure the safety of all the students and staff and folks involved in this threat. And then the thing that broke my heart perhaps the most, apart from the Women's Life Recovery Program graduation thing, that was also a tearjerker. The thing that was really hard to see was all of the gossip, all of the disrespect, all of the hurt and insults that were being just blasted on social media that morning. It was not a perfect incident because you can't plan and prepare for everything. But the words that were used were harmful. The things that were said were said in haste. They were put on a volume and in a public arena where there was no need. And if we were to do no harm, 
we would simply stand as a presence for all of our kids, for all of the staff who went through that wretched experience to say, I'm really sorry that happened, but I'm so glad you're still here. I'm so glad that you're healthy and safe and that we made it through. Churches and and schools and communities and every place are meant to be safe places where no harm is done. And if I had a magic wand to make a wish, I would wish that the internet and that our social media platforms were also that safe place where no harm is done, where cyberbullying is eliminated, where words are thrown out in haste, where pictures are, are posted and, 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 and gambling and everything else is sold, where harm is done on a daily basis. So I think my, my challenge for you in the midst of this time is, is examining how it is that we use our words. And if you have to pick a place or a time, pick, pick your social media. Pick your phone where you text. Pick, pick the person that you talk to that you have a really hard time agreeing with. See if there is a way where you can practice humility, where you can offer grace, where self-control becomes the word of the day. And if it can't be that, if it can't be something that is true, is kind, is necessary, is helpful, then perhaps the answer is simply to zip it. John Wesley will be the first to remind us that salvation is a journey and that we're all being saved day after day, that we all need to come with a contrite and repentant heart over and over because not every day is perfect, not every situation is predictable, and people are sometimes hard to be in relationship with. And so he says we're being saved every day from ourselves and from our sin. We're following Jesus one step at a time, and sometimes we're going to misstep. Sometimes we're going to get off the path. Sometimes we're going to go the wrong way. But life is a journey towards perfection. And if we can just keep ourselves oriented towards these simple rules... Do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. We will seek Christ and his face. Will you pray with me? God, you are holy, and you are good, and you are loving, and you made us in your image to be holy and good and loving ourselves. So today we come to you seeking to practice what we preach, seeking to do better tomorrow than we did today, seeking to live in the light of all that your son Jesus has taught us. Oh God, for all of the times that we fall short and we make mistakes and we say things that harm others, for all of the times that we have remained silent when somebody should have said something, please forgive us. Oh God, your love offers us a second chance, a new day, a new dawn. And so we come with grateful hearts, wanting to do better, wanting to serve you with all that we are and all that we have. Take us just as we are, God, and use us. Use our bodies and minds and spirits and the things that we say and do to build your kingdom. Amen. Rob, what did Twyla bring you? It's now time for our morning offering. This is your opportunity to partner with MUMC in ministries that support our congregation and our community. Everything from food distribution to community dinners to providing a space for medical supplies 
and blood drives. We are making a difference and changing the world together. Now you can place your offering in the donation station at the back of the great room or in the drive up offering box right out here on the north side. Or you can scan the QR code inside the black folders. You can give by visiting our webpage, umcmarshall.org. Or you can even text your offering to the number on the screen. Now, if you'll stand and join us, if you're able. There's still time to sign up for our marriage, marriage vow renewal ceremony, February 19th. If you'd like to join us, there is a clipboard at the back of the great room or contact Maddie here at the church for more information. We would also like to include your original wedding photo in a slideshow that day as well. They can be sent to our media director, Dennis Gorsline. And 
We have something new to tell you about. On President's Day, that's Monday the 20th of this month, we will have a blanket making party in Friendship Hall. D. Russell and Pastor Aaron will be there to help assist while we put together fleece tie blankets, as you see here. Really, I've, I've done one of these in my life. My wife Mariah has done a lot of them in her life. Um, they are really easy, it took us like maybe 10 minutes, um, and they keep you warm. They're all nice and fleece. So the Haven of Rest and Inasmuch House in Battle Creek for everyone is welcome to join us to help and make blankets to keep our neighbors warm. Joanne Fabrics has a great collection of kits you can purchase for a reasonable price. You can put them together as a family and we will be blessing them the following Sunday. This is a great way for all ages to remember those in need during these cold winter months. Snacks and lunch will be provided. I know Ruth Ann would be excited about that. Talk to me after service, me as in Pastor Aaron, if you'd like more information. <laughs> Thank you. Now receive this blessing. May the grace of God uphold you, the peace of God surround you, the love of God flow from you, and the strength of God protect and bring you safely through this day. Amen. Have a great week. Victorious, you 